Missouri failed. Uh, I thought we could overcome the summer attendance debt by promising barbecue. <laughs> so here's the thing. You have to eat like two people worth of barbecue tonight. <laughs> All right, Mark, you're in? I have one. Okay. Uh, I suspect there is plenty of food out there. We are glad that you're here tonight. Uh, this is uh, our eighth of eight meetings. Am I correct in that, Dr. That's correct. Right. No, there's one more. Didn't I tell you? Yeah, no. there's always one more. You know, I came home one day and when my kids were little and my, and my, my youngest said, hey, Dad, how many long morning meetings did you have today? And I thought, maybe I need to change the way I answer the question, Dad, what did you do? Because <laughs> it does seem like sometimes we have a lot of meetings. But uh, anyway, these have been good meetings, and I appreciate your participation. I, I want to tell you just a little bit about, you know, of course, we have the draft, uh, and it's been tweaked a little uh, from what we saw last time, uh, a word here or a word there, but I had the opportunity yesterday to share that with uh, principals, directors, and coordinators at, at our uh, district leadership team meeting yesterday, and we kind of were looking for collective commitments and, and wanted to make sure there wasn't anything in there that nobody could live with and, and things like that. And I see we have exactly no principles that are <laughs> here with us tonight. I wonder what that is. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but that was very well received uh, as we started to think about what are the things that people are going to questions people are going to ask and things like that. It's just that whole, I've been living in this box and I need to be licensed to do these things that are on this page. And we're going to talk more about that tonight, I suspect. Yep. Uh, and then last night, I had the opportunity to share it with Ward. Uh, I do want to take a minute to uh, point out that, Tim, I'm going to call you out here. Uh, Tim De La Vega, who has been a faithful member of our committee last night, was appointed, was appointed, you weren't appointed, you were appointed uh, to the AISD Board of Trustees, and we're thankful for your willingness to serve, and, and congratulations. <laughs> I am thrilled about that. Kim is, is going to join a great team and, and be a wonderful part of our team of that. So, uh, but so last night, as as a part of our agenda, I had a strategic planning update on on the agenda and was able to share with the board kind of the current state of your work, uh, and they are excited about that. Uh, we have a board workshop scheduled for August the 12th, where we'll have kind of a final product from this group where we can, they can then look at their goals as a board and the district goals and, and see what the implications of these strategic priorities and, and belief statements are for their work uh, as, as our board of trustees. So uh, again, I, I know it's been a grind. It's nice not to have a Chick-fil-A sandwich tonight, but thank you for keeping your nose to the grindstone and doing good work because it, it really already people are excited about where this is going to go for us in AISD. So a little bit longer than normal That's right. Sorry. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is, uh, I am glad to be here. And it's been, it, this has been great fun for me. Um, in turn, I love having the conversation about schools and school districts and moving forward and thinking about things and with a new mental model, right? Uh, remember that we're not talking about something else to do in addition to what you've already been doing. We're talking about shifting a way of thinking, shifting your mental model of what good instruction looks like, of what success looks like, of our, our end product. And one of the things that we said either first or second meeting that really has guided some of the work that we've been doing is that content is not king, skills, are equally important to, or maybe even more important than content. And if you remember last time, I showed you an app. You could take a picture of an algebra problem, and it shows you every step, and it gives you the answer instantaneously. And Tracy has it, right? You have it. You have that app. Don't tell. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> right. Um, content. Uh, because of the day and age we live in, cannot be king. It's got to be skills if we look at what do kids need to be successful in life. And certainly kids need to know how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, and know history and understand science and all those things. Absolutely. So we're not ignoring content. We're just not saying that it's the only thing. 
that, that skills are equally, if not more, important than. So as we've done our work, we've been, we've been focusing on this idea of a, of a different way to think, not just trying to do the old things better. We don't need better tutoring. We don't need better intervention. We don't need better detention hall, better in-school suspension. We don't need a better seven period day, right? We need to think differently in terms of what we do. So we develop these beliefs and they, they revolve around deep learning, critical thinking, collaboration, really the idea of relevance and meaning uh, in terms of classrooms, innovation, work ethic, uh, our important cultivation of student strengths and respect, care, and having high expectations for each student is the foundation of learning. There's that coach uh, comment about relationships. We just didn't use the word. Um, so these belief statements, we said early on, should drive our behavior. The difference between all students can learn, which we all believe that, and deep learning involves critical thinking, problem solving, and collaboration is that all students can learn doesn't impact me as the teacher other than saying, they told me you could learn. You can learn, do it, get after it. I've taught it, learn it. But if in fact the core of the classroom is innovation or critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, whatever, deep learning involves critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, then it's my job to come up with collaborative activities, activities where students are problem, solving problems, and activities that really require students to think critically. So we wanted belief statements that drive our behavior, not just the expectations for our students. So we have those. And we've said that the reality of success in our mental model is not a straight path. It will take us lots of different ways down the road and we will fail and we might fail a lot, but when we fail, we learn. And when we learn, we come back and we do things uh, a little differently in order to succeed. The, the perception and reality, on the perception side, it's easy to define success when you're being driven by a standardized test. It's much harder to define success when you are when you're defining success as a productive citizen, as a kid who can follow their passions and make a living, as a kid who can give back to the community, as a, as a student who goes out and is a good mom and, or, or a good dad, a good brother, a good sister, all those sorts of things, that's success. That's what we want for our children. Think about your own children. You want them to pass their classes, but you want them to be productive members of society and see a bigger picture than just academics, right? So it's the reality and the perception are sometimes different. Um, and so I, I thought of this quote, which I love by Doug Reeves, and this will get us kicked off tonight. <clears throat> so when you start thinking about this, in your leadership position, whether you're a parent leader, a student leader, an administrator, a business leader, some, uh, any, any sort of leadership role, don't think about this as we've got to really change the district. Think about it like this. Don't ask us to buy into your ideas for change. Challenge us to envision a future that is better than today. Challenge us to consider improvements in our systems that will happen only if we replace the skepticism associated with the buy-in imperative with the hope and optimism associated with the new ideas, practices, and policies. All of that to say, as you think about this, don't get overwhelmed with, oh my God, this is gonna require us to change. How are we gonna lead this change? Communicate a different future for your kids. Communicate what your classrooms might look like, what a school might look like with this new paradigm or this new mental model of school and what schools can do. So, Henry Ford, love this quote. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? <coughs> That's why we're, we're, the work that we have done is not so much what people expect from this group. The work we've done really paints a picture of you know, where do we want to go, and it's not where we've always been. It's not just a souped up version of where we've been. 
it's, it's thinking differently. <clears throat> so, here's what I want you to think about. And we said from the very beginning that this is all about alignment. We want to align our behaviors and our, uh, our behaviors with what we believe. We want to uh, identify some things that we can work on that will really make a deep impact on the students beyond test, beyond content, beyond curriculum. And so as you think about this, here are our strategic priorities. Making classrooms more meaningful and relevant for students and teachers. Develop a culture, climate, and environment that values collaboration. Build partnerships with local businesses and organizations and tell the AISD story of inspiration, success, and opportunity to the community, parents, and staff. So our first activity tonight, what I, what I want to hear back from you, and I'm going to get you up moving here. Um, what I want you to think about is what does this look like for me? I am a parent of three children. If I am going to live these, this strategic, these strategic priorities out for me in my role as a parent, what do I do? What's the conversation I have with my teachers, my kids' teachers? What's the questions I ask my kids at the end of the day when they come home? What's the conversations I have with parents, other parents? So as a, as a parent, what do I do? As a teacher, what do you do? As a business owner, what do you do? As a principal, what do you do? As a school board member, what do you do? That's what I want to hear from you. And we've had this conversation a little bit over the course of the time. But the, real, the question is, what does it mean? So what? So we believe these. What do I do? And when, before we leave tonight, we're going to get a collective commitment that here's some of the things that you can do even tomorrow to start living this out. We don't have to wait for anything to do the things that we have identified that we can work on. So here's the way it's going to work. And this is going to be a little chaotic, but I like chaos. If you're a parent and you want, and maybe you're, you might be three things, right? A teacher, a parent, and a business owner. You're going to have to identify as one of these right now. So if you identify as a parent mainly in this process, raise your hand. OK. All right, I want you guys to go get right over there. If you identify as a teacher mainly in this process, come stand right up here. Raise your, come stand right up here. Parents, teachers, if you're a business owner slash business community type of person, go stand back there. You represent an organization or a business or a, 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 something that's driving business back there. If you're a community representative, you're a community representative and um, you have a lot of different roles, but you're, you're just here from the community. Come stand right up here. What are you, rest of you people? What are you? Like a, a counselor of some sort. All right, count, uh, go with teachers. Go with teachers. Yeah. You got a student? A student? Student. You come right up here. You're on your own, right here. No, you're not going on your own. I'm just joking. The rest of you are school people, right? Okay. Here's your job. You cannot talk to anybody in this group. You guys can't talk among yourselves. You guys can't talk among yourselves. You guys can't talk among yourselves. I want you to get connected with somebody who is not like you. And here you have one question to answer. What can I do tomorrow to start uh, living these priorities or uh, what can I do? What does this look like for me starting immediately? Stand up. Go have a conversation with someone who's not like you. Uh, we have a student right up here. Come talk to the student. But get, get with somebody. Have this conversation. What does it look like tomorrow? What does it look like tomorrow for you? Okay. 
from where you are. Don't sit down. Throw, throw some things at me. Everybody listen, because you're going to process these ideas in just a second. Uh, but throw some things at me that you heard. This is what I can do. This is how it impacts me as a parent, or as a teacher, or as a principal, or as a school person, as a business person. This is what I can do starting tomorrow. This is how it impacts me. Throw me some things. Intentional conversation. Intentional conversation. That could work for any, anybody of us, right? Intentional conversation about relevance and meaning and skills, OK? Good. Keep going. Bring the practical application of business to the classroom so that folks can tie that in to what they're learning. From the business community, let's bring it in. How might we do it? Externship, internship, uh, in working with a teacher to get a, a group of people to come hear the presentations of a group about some landscaping project or architecture project or some business proposal or business plan they put together. Getting a real authentic group put together to listen to that. Love that. Give me some more. I thought of in my role collaborating with campus staff to find out what are the resources you need, what are the things that you really need to make some of these things happen in the classroom to change your culture. She said that too. I love that. <laughs> so, so a big piece of this is empowering people, right? A big piece of this is empowering teachers to meet the needs of their kids and what better way to start empowering them by asking them intentionally what do you need what have we been doing that doesn't work? What might we change that will work? How can you make this stuff more meaningful for the kids, more relevant for the kids, where they learn at a deeper level than they've been learning? So empowering teachers to make some decisions. I love that. And Keep going. Part of that empowering is encouraging. Absolutely. And specifically for me and my job <laughs> is to walk around and say, it's OK to think about it differently and to, to value these things ahead of the things that we have thought were pretty stinking important. Now, those things are going to take care of themselves, but I think we've got to provide cover fire for, for teachers and campus folks to orient our system a little different. I love the way you said that, and permission is a huge piece of this. If I'm a teacher and I've always just been held accountable for standardized test grades, and now you're saying no, the teacher, they may not say it out loud, they're going to say prove it. And, and the way that you prove it is by that you quit asking about standardized tests and you start asking about collaboration, about innovation, about problem solving, about partnerships that they've had, about real life assessment that they've given kids. How have you assessed your children without using pen and paper recently? How have you gotten your toughest 25% engaged in school? And show me some data about that. Um, so the thing that will derail this work is if we say we're doing all this stuff, but the only thing we ever ask about is how'd you do on the benchmarks? And we just continue to compare people, uh, this classroom against this classroom in terms of benchmark data or in terms of standardized test data. What will drive this work is if you do something different besides that and you start collecting data on innovation and collaboration and problem solving. So that becomes a conversation because that data looks completely different than benchmark data. So what does that look like? Well, let's ask. How could you show me innovation, creativity, and collaboration in your kids? It can be done, but it may look different for first grade than third grade and for physics than seventh grade math. Okay, keep going. Yes, Abby. But I think part of that is connecting the pieces of creativity and innovation um, and the collaboration and telling that story and publicizing it well as it happens. Whether that be through having our kids capture and we put that in social media. I mean, there's just things that we need to do this so that when we see that, people in our district will believe that if they see it happening and we're celebrating it on a regular basis. And if their kids come home talking about it, how was school today? You're not going to believe it, Dad. It was exciting, right? It was awesome. We did this, 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 and this. We have a program called Teacher Tribute, and the kids rec recognize their teacher. Maybe we should have something where businesses or community leaders or faculty recommend, uh, I mean, administrators recommend the teacher or pat the teacher on the back. Or maybe where parents start to pat the teacher on the back and get more engaged. Love it. 
has to be authentic, can't be manufactured. It's got to be uh, from the heart as opposed to, well, this teacher hasn't been recognized in a while, let's do them, or this school hasn't been recognized in a while. Now, you know, there's politics are in everything, so I'm not suggesting we throw everything out and do it differently. Just saying, I love that idea as long as it's authentic, as long as it is a true recognition for your hard work, your effort, the accomplishments that you've had and what you've done. As an employee benefit, I thought about giving time off to employees a designated amount of time off, one day, two days. You can take it in hours or increments, and you just collect that time off, free, free time off to participate in school activities. So if Dr. Young or the teachers are having some event and, I, and they want to go, they have that opportunity to take the time off and not be criticized or penalized for that. They still get that time off. Okay. Paid or unpaid, had thought of giving them that. If I give that, then they have the encouragement to say, maybe I should get engaged. So something from a business standpoint. God just spoke to me and he said paid. So I just, I just wanted you to know I was there. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure of it. See? Yeah. I, I, of all the things I know, that's the one thing I'm sure of that I'm going to leave here tonight. No, that's great. That's great. Keep going. Ways to collaborate with the district. From the first night we met, a lot of the things we talked about are things that I already teach in my graduate program. And so, you know, I think I can really support this move in this direction, and I want to look for ways to do that. But also for teachers that choose to do graduate work, that I build in that structure of how they can think about providing a relevant and meaningful and how they collaborate with each other to create those things. And, um, we, we talk about culture and climate and environment and how does that impact their work. Um, make it go back to where they are, not, you know, um, not just study it. But the most powerful it. thing any of us can do is model this stuff through the conversations that we have. I, I teach a graduate class at A&M and I teach it like a first grade class and I'm not making this up. <clears throat> All the students come in, they're graduate level, they're getting, they're getting their certificate or their master's degree, they come in. I have my little uh, half moon table up here. They're all out there, I have them working and I work with them in small groups, just like my daughter-in-law who teaches first grade. And I work with them and they love it because I'm giving them individual attention, individual care, and I am all over them. I'm not being nice to them. I'm saying you are not a graduate student. You paid your money but I promise you, this is not graduate student writing, okay? This is what you have to do. Rather than marking something up and giving it back to them, it's a personal conversation just like you would have in a first grade classroom. They love it uh, in terms of the structure of the class. So I can model that. But whatever our job is, modeling the conversations, modeling the work, is the most powerful thing that we can do, I think. One more. What can you do starting tonight or tomorrow in terms of the impact for you as a as a parent, school board, whatever. I was uh, I work for a nonprofit. I was thinking about service learning and um, ways that kids can tackle a problem that's a community problem. But I also thought about how businesses adopt schools. What if the schools adopt a certain nonprofit? What if Jackson Elementary adopted Hope Haven and decorated a child's room? Or love it. Yeah. Different partnerships like that. We don't have to think about partnerships the way we've always thought about them. Love the idea of finding real problems in Abilene and getting a group of kids to work on them and making a proposal to the group that's, that is supposed to be solving this problem. Somebody mentioned potholes not too long ago. I hope nobody's for the city here, but somebody mentioned potholes. They did. How might we address that issue and then present it? All right. <clears throat> Lots of good ideas. You're doing the same thing with somebody else again. Somebody not like you. Do your best. You can be in groups of three. So just walk and talk again with somebody else. You're still answering the same question. You can build on the ideas that you just heard. Or you can come up with whole new ideas in terms of how can this impact me in my role. On your mark, get set, go. Talk to somebody else. Like, like last time. While you're still standing, shoot some things at me. What can you do to, to model, what now, what can you do in your role to live these street strategic priorities out?
Give me some more feedback. Be supportive by creating that environment and being a part of that grassroots movement where you're making, I'm able to make changes in my classroom where people will question and get them involved. You start something, you start doing things differently in your classroom, somebody's going to come to you and say, who told you you could do that? You're going to say, nobody. You want to do it with me, right? <laughs> Let, let's do this. I don't think anybody can complain about kids getting excited about learning, about trying some things differently. Yeah, so start working some She's things. She's already and, started. Uh, I know she has. So <laughs> start creating these opportunities for conversations with other people. What else? What can you do? Communication open between you and your child and you and your children's teacher or your child's teacher. Just keep those lines open, even in middle school and high school. Keep them open. For me, it changes the questions I ask my kids' teachers. Yeah, what are you doing? To, I mean, not mean, right? But what are you doing to make this really, how do you make al algebra relevant for my kid? Because I promise he don't care, right? How do you make al algebra relevant for my child? What are some ideas? Can we talk about? this in terms of the real world. What does it look like? How might we integrate a project? Or how could you integrate a real world project into this? He knows how to do math, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't know what to do with it out in the world. Right? So changes the questions maybe you ask. Okay? There's a, a brilliant epiphany here. Okay. I love that. that we we can all go home. Yes. About. We were talking about it. Just, uh, it's a little bit different. It's a different spin. But it's, you know, we talk about our partnerships with businesses and organizations and our parents in the community. What about, instead of bringing our parents and community members in, what if we go out? And so what if we have our meetings at the park? Or we go to the park just to have fun with our parents and it's a non-threatening way. Or if we're, before school starts, we do different things here and there. What if we do serve a meal? I bet we could do that. We could, I know our police department's doing it some. Um, but what if we do a flipped type of a meet your school Tracy, type of Tracy, a new event? And so I didn't really do it as much just for you all. That was awesome. I'm sorry you missed it. But it started with doing something as simple as, as your teacher in, a, in elementary, and I know happens a lot is before school starts. As a teacher, I would always send every single student that I had just a letter, I'm so glad to have you. We're gonna have a great year, you know, all of that. I mean, just something as small as that, but then maybe it's, we're out at the laundromat one day. Just, hey, we're here, we wanna meet you, can we free come back to school? Just that type of thing, and just throughout the year. So that when a parent does get the phone call when Johnny does have a hard time, it's not about that, it's about, we understand better about where our children come from. So it's a little bit different, but. I like it, uh, I, th I think it's, a fresh way to think, and that's what we're looking for, a fresh way to think, not redoing what we've always done better, but a fresh way to think, new things to do. Keep going. A couple more ideas. One thing we talk about is we talk about the parents, yeah. communication with the parents and students is giving parents tools to have those conversations with the students that around, if they ever gather around you know, the silver table or whatever, even when it's something the kids develop when it's an app, a series of questions, whatever, that can get that you know, where they can tell them what's happening. Absolutely, yeah. Inform the parents, prepare the parents, uh, give the parents a, a rubric that they can ask their kids about. Yeah. That was, that was Kimberly can explain better than I can. Well, I had a great conversation with Tracy last stop and she was sharing how her parents do such a fantastic job of asking her about her day. It's not a, how was your day today, but they ask her um, who did she impact today? For whom did she make a difference today? Um, who did she work with today? Um, what was hard in mm -hmm. her school work today? I mean, they, they ask questions that promote that conversation and emphasize to her that they expect those things. They mm -hmm. expect things to be challenging. They expect her to work with others, and they expect her to make a difference in other people's lives. So I thought, you know, probably I would venture a guess that our kids most in need don't have parents that are likely to ask those questions. Um, Maybe maybe they're not all together at one time, or maybe it's you know generations of kids taking care of each other. But if we were to empower the home with a tool that can help promote the conversation, then you know those questions could be generated like kids, you know, from kids like Tracy who have those kinds of experiences at home, and then share those out with their classmates. 
right. as well. I'm not sure that the teacher, I mean, the parent knows the questions to ask. That That's, we're what we're about. Right. So That's great. That's great. Do you have more engaged parents in the elementary schools? Sure. I would say yes. Sure. Novicely saying yes. And so maybe this needs to be, the education needs to come at the elementary school level with the parent who's engaged and say, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach relevance and you need to be asking your students this instead of that and giving and educate our parents to what we're trying to accomplish at an early age so they grow up with those questions because asking a junior or senior's parents right. is kind of... They're already so ingrained. All right. It becomes the way we do things around here, right? Yeah, the culture, climate, environment. Down. Coach, and then Tracy, and then we'll go. I'll let you sit down. The big deal in athletics that we have every year is a parent, and this is what, kind of what we're talking about, and setting the expectations and letting them know what's going to happen. I mean, we try to have open houses, but what do we get? 10, 15 percent of the kids that are the parents come. Um, you know, if there was some way, you know, we can come up with a figure out, a uh, figure out how to get. To the parents of those who don't care, you know. Right. And believe it or not, there's there's a lot more that don't care, <clears throat> and uh, they're just sending their kids off and and don't care how their day went. You know. So how do, how do we change that? Right. One parent at a time, probably, but strategy sessions like this targeting that specific thing, right? The parent engagement piece could probably produce some pretty impactful things or probably have some pretty good ideas as to, well, let's try this, this, or this that we haven't done. I like it. Tracy. Um, for me as a student, I like, I know, try to be more um, into classroom activities and like to try and make a change in the classroom and try to interact with teachers and also having a good attitude in class. And we like for me as a student to tell you experience and teachers is like the way you interact with your students means a lot. Like the way you talk to them means a lot. And the way you say you don't know the questions, ask your like your yeah, your children. You just like start with how was your day? And then I mean you first have to learn your your, your child because not all child are like me. Every every child is different from the other. So maybe some of them don't like to talk about school stuff. And for me, I like to talk about school stuff. Because if my brain doesn't ask me about that, I feel like they're pushing me away. About, like <laughs> trying to, like, you know, we, I like attention from my parents. That, that's me. But you ask them, how was your day? And what impact did you make in school? How did he help you? What challenged you today? And, you know, you just try and interact. But don't be so hard on them. Like, don't be over serious with them, like trying right. to make jokes in between it and <laughs> Right, right. So the, right. You're not a robot as a parent. Here are not the the right questions, but here's some ideas as to the questions you might ask and um, and it's an interesting way to think about maybe collecting some data too, uh, some different data from parents about their kids. And I don't know how that might work, but uh, there might be something there. All right, go back and sit down. Y'all are great. <clears throat> So I want to show you a couple of real life schools that are doing this. These are not mythical schools somewhere. These are schools in Texas where I know the principals and I know some of the people that work at these schools. And what you're going to note is uh, note some of the things that they're doing and see if you can grab an idea to say, oh, that would be a great thing for us to do at my school or this is something we ought to think about or as a parent say, man, I wonder if my principal even knows about that. So and if you, you can watch all of these if you go to this website. It's called theprincipalinstitute.org, theprincipalinstitute.org. You go front and center, comes up, principals, and now a principal. Oh. I messed that up, didn't I? Principals Institute announces 2017 schools transforming learning. Here's a tour of the schools. And I've picked a couple of them I want you to watch. This is Roberts Road Elementary School in Waller, Texas. 
It's five minutes. It's a little longer than I would like. However, I'm gonna, you're going to watch it all the way through. I want you to quickly learn some things that they're doing at this campus. <coughs> Space. This is our uh, makerspace that we have in the library. We have a makerspace design team that got together and decided what supplies we needed and what would be best for the students so that they could create and make and use some of those um, passionate imaginations. So um, what really excites me the most about technology is the fact that it, it removes the four walls from our, from our school. Um, they're able to go home and do things on the computer. It also allows for collaboration between the students and teachers. It, um, it changes the roles in the classroom. Uh, it gives the students more of an opportunity to, to learn on their own and grow on their own, and we're just more of a facilitator. Some of the free websites that are really great are Kahoot and Quizzes. We use that a lot. Anytime you can gamify learning, it just enhances your engagement in the classroom. We use different things in our classrooms, and Google Classroom is a big one, like if you're absent or something. If you have a computer at home, you can do it at home. And so you don't just have the stuff that you have to do at school. You can do it at home, and so that's cool. My name is Rachel Neal. I teach second grade here at Roberts Road. This is my second year on this campus, so I've been very excited to participate in our Teachers Observing Teachers and watch it grow while I've been here. We've been practicing it for about three years now. The first year, we were going into classrooms and watching each other teach and giving each other feedback, so really talking to each other, what's going well in the classroom, what can we improve on. And as we've gone along, as the years have gone by, we've really focused on changing it from that congenial feedback, oh, great job, to really collegial and trying to improve ourselves and our own practice. It's been really great this year, as our campus has moved to the T-test observations for our final evaluation, we've really been able to align our personal goals to our teachers as a read teacher. So when my cohort comes in and observes me, they're really specifically looking for my goal. So how my journey as a team leader started was actually extremely helpful. We had a workshop and we laid out all of the areas that we wanted to make sure we improved and focused on for each team, really define what a successful team looks like. So that's one area. Another area is every other week we have team leader meetings where the first item on our agenda is always leadership. We could be doing an interactive activity where we express how this relates to our leadership style or reading current information on things going on in the realm of education and how that relates to us as leaders and how we can help our teachers on our teams as well. Part of our journey here with technology has been to be able to provide staff development for our teachers that's personalized, uh, encouraging them to help take risks. One part is Ed Camp. We do that twice a year at the beginning and the middle. Uh, teachers are going into the classrooms. They can be like a 10 to 15 minute uh, quick showing of something in technology they've learned that's exciting. The other part is uh, a bi-weekly event and our teachers sign up to do a, what we call a technology sneak peek. And again, they share something they've learned with the staff. At Robert Road, we really strive to create learning experiences for the students. Instead of the traditional lesson plans, we really work to create lesson design and learning experiences that students can take with them in the future. To do this, we work to create lessons that are engaging, that are memorable, and that are student-driven. 
It's so exciting to go in the halls and see a first grader creating an iMovie or go down the third grade hall and see students using Google Classroom to share their work with the world. Not only are our students growing as learners, but our teachers are growing as well. Robert's Girl Elementary transforming to meet the needs of 21st century students. Roberts Road Elementary. Angie Davis is the uh, principal there. She went to Texas Tech, grew up in Lubbock. I got connected with her through the Principals Institute, which is one of the things Into Learning does. And uh, I love it because we told the principal to make a video and you never see Angie. She's never even in the video, but it highlights makerspace, flexible seating, ed camp idea, teachers observing teachers, all these things that I would consider at least transformative in terms of building on the uh, work uh, to make school a little different than it has been. I'm going to show you one more, and this is a high school sneak peek. And this is from McKinney Boyd High School in McKinney. It's just an interesting thing that they're doing in terms of transformation, empowering teachers. Welcome to the School of the Future, McKinney Boyd High School, home of the Broncos. We currently have 2,900 students and are located north of the DFW area. We'd like to take the next few minutes to introduce to you our design center. Our design center is an area for our teachers to gather, to collaborate, design, and plan engaging lessons in a safe and welcoming environment. With the help of our instructional coaches, our media specialists, and our technology experts on our campus, our teachers are given time once every quarter in order to get together and plan engaging lessons that will better serve our students. The goal of the Design Center is to have less teacher-directed instruction and more discovery, application, and exploration concepts. We are looking for more student-directed learning where students are more involved in the learning process. Because of the Design Center and the concept that our teachers learn, we are seeing a much more developed PLC process outside of the Design Center as well. Recently, McKinney Boy High School was certified as a level one high reliability school with the Marzano Institute. Our PLC process, coupled with teacher exploration in the Design Center, has bridged the gap between traditional learning and blended learning of the future. Here we see students implementing technology and student analysis of a given concept. Time is spent designing the lesson from introduction all the way through assessment. Instead of assessment always involving pencil and paper, here you see our students actually testing the theory and developing their own conclusions from data. About two years ago, we also included our language other than English department and also our CTE department. We're reaching out to not only the core areas, but also the elective classes. Here is an example of a Money Matters class that created a monopoly game based on current real world assets and prices. The ultimate goal is we want students to be more involved in their learning, more hands-on, elaborate projects with a higher level of questioning and discovery here at McKinney Boyd High School, we have built a culture of family, tradition, and relationships. We want our students to not only be a part of the social culture, but also the instructional culture as well. Plans for the future include students becoming part of our design center and our design team, leading students to design curriculum coupled with the knowledge and creativity of our amazing teachers. We believe at McKinney Boyd High School that student engagement is paramount to all that we do. An engaged student is not only productive, but more entrenched into our school culture. Why wouldn't we give teachers the support, time, and resources to do just that? Thank you for taking the time to learn about our path to the future of student learning. For more information, please visit our website and go Broncos. <laughs> Those are not the most exciting videos I know, but as I was thinking, uh, how do I communicate to you that this can be done? And it is being done at places in Texas that are real where you know some of the people. Those are just two very brief examples. A design center for teachers, 
What is the principal's job in that? Figuring out how to give teachers the time and to get her experts in technology and instructional design all together at the same time. And it, it's not an English team that goes in. It's a math teacher and an English teacher and a science teacher. And they work together to develop these uh, more elaborate experiences for students. But it's very intentional. It gets to meaning and relevance and other pieces that we're talking about. So what's something you heard from those two videos that you thought, we might be able to do that. We ought to check that out. That's interesting. Something that resonated with you. We, I know we have some elementary classes that are doing the flexible seating. Flexible seating? To me, that's like, that should just be no -brainer. the standard. Flexible seating. Love those places where you go in and it's, uh, you know, you. The couple of places where I go, I can go in, instead of having round tables, they have all this different furniture and you get what you want when you go in. And you sit where you want and I always get a standing desk because you can tell I'm very antsy. And so it's hard for me to sit very long. So I get a standing desk and I go and I lean on that while whatever we're doing, whatever it is we're doing. So flexible seating is something that can be done, costs a little money, but it can be done. Yes. Uh, one thing I really appreciate was the collaboration of the teachers, and I don't know if do we do that now? Do we do that now in our schools? Is there a time allotted for? I wasn't sure. I, I really like the idea of that. I never really thought the way she wrote it was it's a safe, safe environment, and you would think among the adults that have been given. But by, by her stating that, that tells me that there are some teachers that may be uh, project killers yeah. versus supporter. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. I, I have the utmost respect for teachers and believe that it is the one of the hardest jobs in the world because you're dealing with multiple personalities all at a different, you know, the analogy is uh, a doctor deals with one person at a time and maybe 25 or 30 over the course of a day, right? If they're seeing a lot of patients. And each one they see individually, and they have one or two people come in to support them, right? One to do the diagnostics, another to give the history, and the doctors, you know, theoretically, you have a doctor with good bedside matter, he's asking you, you know, what are the issues, what are you doing? Okay, let's try this, 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 and this, come back and see me. The teacher gets 22 at once with very little help, real-time help, in terms of somebody there, hands-on support. So I have the utmost respect for teachers and the difficulty of the work. I also know that teachers can, if you do something really different than me, as a teacher, I'm not gonna be like, Tiffany, what are you doing? You know, you're making me look bad over here. Your kids are like cracking eggs and throwing stuff and mine are working out of the workbook. So, there is some of that. So developing a culture where that is, you know, where creativity and innovation is encouraged and not stifled and where teachers are empowered and you have strong teachers who just say, hey, I'm going to do it. Now, from the teachers, is that true or not true? Tell me. True? A little bit? But you don't care, do you, Ashley? You just move forward. You just keep going. I love that about you. I think it's a real thing, so you have to be sensitive to it. It, it can be coming from the standpoint of that you're doing something different, or you're doing something different because you have your class can handle that. Yeah. You know, you can get it from all kinds of ways. Yeah. So creating this culture of we want to be innovative and creative and collaborative, where it's the rule, not the exception, where that great classroom is not the exception to the rule, it is the rule. We're all creative, we're all collaborative, and that raises the bar for everyone is really what we're pushing toward. Okay, so the collaboration was interesting, the flexible seating was interesting. What else was interesting? See? Well, the collaboration amongst the teachers, I think. If you gave, I, I, I'm a big believer in business within a school, right? and I think you just, for a simple deal, you, you fix an iPad in school, it costs 50 bucks or a pound, 50 bucks, but nobody knows about it. So if a bunch of teachers got together, let's say an accountant got together and he figured out how to inventory, and a business teacher got together and figured out how to make a business plan, they had to get the 
English teacher to figure out how to write the business plan. Then they had to have somebody else do something for marketing, so they had to get marketing. And all the teachers got together and said, okay, how can we promote the sale of an iPhone repair facility at the school and, let the, and then let the students advertise it and bring people to the school to sell the, the wares. So then they connect with the community and get uh, somebody from that room, which is a computer company, to, yep. to oversee. And that way, that, that then they're all talking about how to connect the different disciplines. And, that, and it's, it, it's just what we do. I have an accountant that takes care of my business, you know, my right. PA stuff. And I have somebody does something. So that type of thing, that collaboration in a group of settings. Right. The powerful piece is the opportunity to collaborate, the, the time available to do so, the connecting of the dots between disciplines, the real world meaningful activity, capitalizing on skills that kids probably have better than us in terms of technology and repair in the example that you gave. Yeah. One more thing. Yes. I'm not familiar with Makerspace, but it looks really cool. So, Who's starting one? I love that. So let me show you. You know, I mean, it look like. You can Google Makerspace and pull a thousand different websites. I just pulled this one. It says seven things you should know. I think it's what it's called. Um, yeah, seven things you should know about Makerspace. This is a business article, not an education article. Makerspaces were started by the business world. And in College Station, or actually in Bryan, Texas, if you go down to downtown Bryan, one of our young entrepreneurs has started a Makerspace. So you go in and you pay a fee and you can knock yourself out. He's got all sorts of gizmos and gadgets and gadgets and stuff in there that he, and people go, they go on a Friday night with a group of people and they do stuff. It's kind of like escape rooms, you know? Familiar with escape rooms where you have to work through and get a coat? It's people working together on stuff that's fun. And that's, it started in the business world and it's kind of a hack, you know, you, you know the hack community hacking in to do things. Well, Makerspace was an offshoot of that hack community. And it was to allow people to come up with uh, inventions, collaboration, novel ideas, create ideas, and then that has translated into schools. And it's a space with stuff. Electronic stuff, Lego stuff, all sorts of stuff. And, and, then, and then kids are allotted time. Uh, on a routine basis to go without much direction. The rules are pretty simple. Make some stuff and work together. Yes? I'm just going to add what you're saying to the quick plug for ACU. They have a maker lab. And the summer is really slow. And so if you want to just keep, keep your head in, it's free to the community, free to ACU students. And then each summer they have a maker at Academy Camp. So uh, one of my daughters did the last week and she. She's nine, and she made like 15 different things. She learned how to solder. She made a, bit, a boat that was sail-worthy, and they sailed it on the lake. Um, she did electricity. Uh, she was an electrician and built a lamp that she's using in her room, and I mean, she was just on fire about it. Yeah. Darren Wilson is printers, director. The 3D printers. Anytime my kids need to build something, and I don't have their equipment or the resources or the knowledge to do it, I just call him and say, hey, I'm sending this kid over to back on Tuesday. Can you take care of them? And they do that. They have a lot of time. They have a lot of time. And they do. And my kids come back with these awesome things. And they're, they're super yeah. passionate about they're, sharing yeah. their ideas. So it's really not like they're, I mean, you can just go in and ask them a million questions. They'll share with you. And then anything that you want to take pictures of or copy or whatever and to do at your school, mm -hmm. Darren a good step that is aligned I think with a lot of this is creating a maker space but you can't just create it you have to help people understand why it's important and what the significance of it is so here's what happens in the maker spaces I've seen the maker spaces become those spaces for GT kids because all the other kids don't have time because they need more math they need more English they need more of this and that is not the idea the idea is not to create a space for your advantage kids to get more advantage. The idea is to create a space that will be good for all kids. All kids. Yes, the, the ones who are already performing well, absolutely they need to be in there. But the ones who aren't performing well, this is their spot. This is their time. This is where you look at him and say, man, I didn't know you could do that. 
how'd you make that clock work? Or what gave you that idea to build that this way? Or that's an interesting design, right? So that's where you learn about kids as you watch them. And you're able to give them some time where they're not uh, being directed all the time. That, uh, aligned with that is such thing as a genius hour. I think we have some of those videos talk about genius hour. Genius, genius hour is not unlike a maker space. It, it's a little less uh, space intensive and more idea intensive where you allow kids to work on something they want to work on for one hour every day. And it comes from the Google idea, right, where or it wasn't Google, it was Accenture, I think, who allowed their employees one day every two weeks to work on something, uh, whatever they wanted to work on. Uh, and the result was that they got all sorts of solutions and ideas for other marketable or for to fix problems they had and to, to market new items for the company. And so it was just this genius hour. Work on what you want to work on. Read what you want to read. Write what you develop. You know, and kids are going to develop plays, right? Some kids are going to develop plays. Some kids are going to read. Some kids are going to do something with athletics. They're going to make a better football. Or they're going to, you know, make new rules for football game that would be better. And your job as a teacher is to say, no, that's not the rules. No, your job is to say, that's awesome. Let's figure out how we can do that. Let's go play this game and see if it works, right? So it is widening the lanes for kids. All right, what else did you hear? Makerspace, flexible spaces, collaboration. I think I saw two things that I really liked. Number one, in every, both the elementary and the high school, um, we talked about the collaboration of the, the teachers, but in every single scene, the kids were together. Um, and the kids were collaborating, and the kids were, you could tell they weren't just sitting together, they were working together on a similar, on, on the same project. Um, so I liked that, that collaboration went throughout. Um, and I think you, you could really tell that there had been some intentional professional development for the teachers, um, because out of that design space, out of that, the collaboration meetings, all of the, the activities that were featured showed that assessment that was not a pencil and paper. It showed that, I really, at one point she said, you know, we don't test them on pencil and paper, we test them, they get to go out and build their thing and test their theory and make observations and analyze the data. And that, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. Like a teacher doesn't just naturally do that based upon the training that we've had. And so you can tell there was some intentional professional development yep. behind the scenes. Um, that, or like the Monopoly game. You know, I mean, it's like there was something that they were doing, developing, testing, analyzing. Um, yep. Within those lessons that they designed. So much positive comes out with an, with an initial start. You start this and then you get tentacles that go good ways out from that. So you start a design team and the result is Man, we're having better conversations, not just in the design team, but when we get together with PLCs, professional learning communities, and our English teachers are meeting together, we're extending that conversation into these. Or you start a makerspace, and all of a sudden you learn something about a kid, and so you say to that kid, hey, you should read this book, or you should try this book, or why don't you write about this this time instead of everybody else is writing about this, but I want you to write about this, right? Because you know that kid well, and you have the authority and the freedom as the teacher to be able to do that for that kid. So all sorts of good things happen. I think grading uh, more enjoyable too. Might make the same thing. You don't have to read the same paper about Huckleberry Finn 400 times, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, the 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 idea. Now, keep in mind that these two schools in particular have been working on this for a while. They didn't all start with flexible seating, maker spaces, teachers observing teachers, ed camp. I mean, there were five or six things in that Roberts Road thing that they're doing. They didn't, they didn't start this last year. Over the years, they've developed it. Same is true for McKinney Boyd High School. Jennifer Pearson's been the principal there. She is a no-nonsense person. She scares me just a little. Um, <laughs> she is a no-nonsense person in terms of, you know, that high school principal, uh, we're going to get stuff done. She's very task-oriented, but she's very creative and very transformational. So this is not for a type. You know, well, you're creative. I'm not. I'm a manager. No, she's a, she's a manager. She's great. 
She has taken her management ability and moved it over here to let's do some transformative things in our school. Design teams for teachers. It's any, that's not all they're doing, obviously, but it impacts the design. Then it impacts the assessment. Then it impacts the collaboration of the teachers. And then, you know, it just keeps spreading. So I, I think you get started. So all of that to say Makerspace, lots of stuff out there on the web about Makerspace. And as a parent, you could take it to your teacher or a principal. As a principal, you could take it back and say, how might this look and what can we work on? Okay? It's good stuff. Um, so much of what we're talking about are these, these personalizing, empowering teachers and students, giving them permission and personalizing. If I had to just take one idea and say, okay, in this new mental model, what's this about? This new mental model is about empowering, uh, allowing teachers to run, uh, bringing students in. I love what McKinney Boyd High School said, the principal, Ms. Pearson said. She said, we're trying to get the kids not just involved in the social culture of the school, but the instructional culture of the school. So they're including, I think, starting this next year, they're including students on the design team. So when the teachers sit down and say, well, how should we teach this standard? It's teachers talking and then a student can chime in as well and say, well, what if you did it this way? Or what if we looked at it like this? That is bringing the students into the instructional culture. That is empowering students, and it's empowering teachers, and it's widening their lane. So if you had to boil it down, and I think empowerment is a huge idea. Uh, I don't want to go any further. We mentioned it earlier, but permission is huge. Permission is not just something you can say. As a, as, a, as a principal, I can't just go to a teacher and say, you have permission to be creative, innovative, and I want you to collaborate, okay? Teacher may or may not know what that means. You, as the principal, have to set up professional development that is collaborative, where you take risk, that is problem solving, where you're critical thinking. You model it. Then once you model it, then your words start to mean something to somebody. This is what I want your classroom to look like. You have permission. You, you have permission to not teach all the standards. I mean, that blows people away a lot of the times because we're so conditioned to teaching all of the standards that we have. You just can't do it in this model. You can't, you gotta be careful about which ones you don't teach but you can't teach every standard in this model. So there are risks. To teach deeper, you gotta go deeper. You can't, you can't try to cover everything like you've always tried to cover. Doesn't mean a lot to electives teachers. They don't have that many standards anyway. But for the social studies teacher, oh my gosh. If you taught every social studies standard, I think it's in US history, you could spend eight minutes per standard if you were in school every day. Eight minutes, that's, you can't teach anything in eight minutes. So you gotta be selective. What do I need my kids to learn at a deep level? So it's, it's giving teachers some um, empowerment. And then the last thing is just personalize. <clears throat> you need something different than the rest of the group. What do you need? What are you going to grow on? How are you going to establish your personalized learning plan? How do you model that as a staff? Uh, how do you model that as a principal? What can you do? What kind of professional development can you set up so that people can learn where they are? Um, I think is a powerful piece of this is too. So this empowerment idea is a huge one. <clears throat> we talked about skills a lot. Skills equal to at least content. So as a teacher, I'm teaching skills, not just content. That's a huge shift for m many of us. So we want to, um, as we think about that in our, as in, in our planning, how do, you, how do you weave teaching skills in? Uh, engagement, empowerment, 
And then I, I just want to camp out on this one for a minute, and that is you, you got to have the courage to try this. And, and um, the, is she going to fall down the middle? She's not going to make it. I kind of thought that when I put it up there, but I put it up there anyway. What you don't see is there's a trampoline right underneath her. And she is going to jump. So, so what's that? Jumping on a trampoline in hills is equally. Yeah, I like the hill, hill, heels piece of it too. So, so here's the deal. If this doesn't make you a little bit nervous, then we've done something wrong, right? Should scare you a little and excite you a lot in terms of opportunities for kids. If, if Abilene wanted to do it the way it's always been done, we would have talked about what can we do to get better star scores. But nobody, the very first day we said, what are your highest aspirations for your kids? Nobody said, man, I really want my kids to all pass the star test. I mean, I think we do want them to pass, but that's not our highest aspiration, right? It was about passion. It was about fulfilling your potential. It was about being a good citizen in the community and changing the community in which you live. That's what we want for our kids. And if we want to uh, really push hard on that, we have to take these ideas and really begin to uh, push them in the sense of getting them established in the culture of the district, in the curriculum instruction, business, communications, the culture of the district offices, and then the culture of each campus as well. So it's a long-term project, a lot of work, but that is the work. Um, I'm going to let you go early tonight, but here's what you have to do in order to get out. Everybody is going to give me a little feedback where everybody else can hear. Not feedback as in um, the quality, the feedback as in to here's a question I have that I'm leaving with, or here's what I'm going to do, or this is what I'm inspired to do right now, or here's what I'm going to be thinking about. So everybody in the group is going to give me a little nugget. We're going to stand up. We're going to get in a circle. And everybody's going to give me a little nugget of this is what it means to me kind of thing. And I'm going to do it too. And then we'll, we'll, we'll ready break and we'll go from here. Um, I will be back at some point uh, in August and to really talk with the board about some of the strategic planning and working together and leading this work and some goals maybe for the board related to this. Dr. Young and staff will be massaging this in terms of what do we do now with this uh, in terms of the work. And so there, this is just the first push of the ball in terms of starting and beginning the process of, of establishing this kind of work in Abilene. So everybody stand up, circle around. Now this, this can be painful or this can be fun. Let's, let's, no, let's make it fun. Let's make it fun. Everybody, now, hey. I don't know if you got to preach on Sunday or not, so this is not sermon time. This is nugget time. This is what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm leaving with. This is what this has meant to me. Uh, this is a question I have. Here's what I'm thinking, or here's what I'm leaving thinking about. So uh, we won't go in order, but everybody has to go. Okay, so you hold your neighbors to the right and to the left of you accountable, and somebody just start us off, and then don't let any time, too much time, go in between. Yes, Coach. I think that uh, I think that this is a scary, like you said, it's it's scary because teachers are, I mean, they've known one thing their whole career, and uh, that's that's all they know, and they're worried about their test scores. Uh, having the concept of not having to to. Uh, you know, leave out some of the contents where they can expand their thing. I think that's a great idea, and it relieves a lot of the pressure that, I mean, because all, all they know now is I got to do this, I got to cover this, I got to cover that, and, uh, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on those people. Yep, yep. Abby? Curriculum adjustments. Curriculum adjustments. That's a nugget. Yeah, he said scary. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not a nugget. No, 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 no. I'm going to 
Those, those were great. Those were great. I'm scared that it's a, it's too big of a monster that my son, who's three, is going to graduate and not be able to reap the rewards of what we're doing. Like, I'm, I'm, that's kind of a, a, a hyper fear, but I think I'm hoping that like my daughters in elementary school can continue to kind of have this and they don't just end up going through the same thing that I did. I'm with Mark on that. My daughter's going into sixth grade. She's not a strong student. She did not pass the star test in fifth grade this last year twice. And she's, she's an AB honor roll student, but she can't test. And um, this is scary to say out loud, but we put her in special ed this year so she could go on to sixth grade. She didn't qualify for learning disability. By learning disability, she qualified because of her ADHD diagnosis. This whole thing excites me very much because I think it would really benefit her. But I'm afraid it's going to take so long to roll out that she won't get any of the benefits of it. And I have one starting kindergarten. Now maybe he will, I hope, I'm crossing my fingers. But I think this would be wonderful for my daughter. And I really hope that, I hope it, it happens. And I, would, I want you to come talk to all the teachers <laughs> before school starts. That's a big whole group. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Kind of going along the line with that, like the te teachers, my concern is, especially at the high school level, is the time to share all this mm -hmm. and to collaborate with teachers. I know um, the ninth grade academy, I'm not sure if they still do this, but uh, ninth grade academy teachers, they all had an extra planning period to kind of discuss things and talk about stuff. You know, how about building up ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade having an academy too? So that way we can implement these things and share these ideas. Um, you know, because I'm excited about some of these things. In my classroom, since it's, it's my own curriculum, I get to break some of the rules. There you go. And I love that. And I love that I can do something different than the, a normal, regular English teacher. And I would love to share some of the things that I do to, that, that I do that I build trust with my students. Um, you know, how I get them to learn, how do I get them to behave? How do I, you know, get them to do some of the things in my classroom that they won't do in another classroom? And yeah. so, you know, just that time, you know, how can we start to say, okay, you know, teachers, you have this time period for each other to collaborate. Right. That's a great question. And that's what every principal ought to be asking. <clears throat> that becomes one of the principal's primary jobs. Keep I'm going. Piggybacking off of that, I've been really fortunate in that I've taught in a place where I do have a lot of freedom and we do collaborate weekly, cross curricularly, and I can do whatever I want and nobody bats an eye. And so I'm really, to me, that's benefited my kids so much. And I, like, I know that it works because I do it every day for several years. And I'm really excited to push that out and to make that bigger and, and to, 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 for other teachers to get to experience what that kind of freedom is like, to, to see what happens to their kids. Beautiful. Go Keep going, and Tiffany. Too, it's kind of, there's a lot of teachers that are going to be, and a lot of them aren't going to be excited, but there's a lot that are that are ready to come out from underground. And to have that permission, but in my mind, I'm also a fear of, you know, we want to do it right. Yeah. right. We want to do it in such a way that others do want to do it. Right. So that's yeah. so it's people like you that make me really excited to be here. So this is my sixth day at work at AISD. <laughs> and, right. uh, and my my I, I brought my kids, my eight and nine year old, and moved six hours from where I was to be in a place where this is possible. And um, I'm excited that part of my job is to help find um, supports and structures that promote educational health that promote teachers feeling comfortable taking the risk, um, knowing that they've got cover fire, like the superintendent says, like here, we're gonna promote your success by helping you learn habits and routines that that instead of confining you, free you. It's beautiful, it's great, keep going. I think the, uh, the teachers will take care of themselves because I think this group will uh, spread the virus that we've had, that we've learned. 
Uh, so my thought would be communicate with parents. Okay. That's it. Okay. Parents. Communicate with parents. <laughs> Keep. Communicate. Go ahead. Excited about our new story. This is a new story. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm coming away thinking, especially tonight, thinking, how can I go back and explore ways that, as a business owner, I can help out with the educational process? What are we doing in my business that could benefit the kids and what they're learning today? And another note, um, as a husband of a teacher who attended a board meeting last night, the thing that was the most exciting for her was Dr. Young's presentation about what's going on in this room. Beautiful. She was genuinely excited. i have been telling her about it. She didn't believe me, but she believed <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Keep going. So I have four children in the district um, who feel like they spend seven hours a day kind of checking off the box, like I'm going to go sit there, do my thing, and then when I get home and on the weekends and stuff, we've been trying to like empower our kids to learn and research on their own, and they love doing that, and they're engaged and excited about it, but I'm feeling more excited about being proactive with, with the teachers. Like, we've just tried to be really encouraging and thankful sure. to our teachers, but maybe saying, hey, how can my, my child or this group of students um, help with the curriculum, and I think that would really excite my Yep. Love it. Gail? I think uh, I'm just kind of scary, like it's been said by, by others, just because of, you know, what we've done for the last 10, 20, 30 years that I've been a part of on the other side, and so it, it's hard to change, but you have to step back and say it's 2017, and I think about, I have six grandchildren, and, and I want them to have the experiences like I saw on the screen, not the experiences that I had, and even the experiences that I had as, a, as an administrator, as a, as a building principal. So, you know, it's time to, it's time to move on. That's great. I'm Keep going. about how we can provide that safety net that gives the teachers who, who aren't already as, you know, strong and courageous as some of the teachers we have in this room, um, to be brave enough to do something. To step out. Yep. Love it. Keep going. I'm excited about a group of upper administrators who are open to this concept because I think in some districts they wouldn't be. And, um, you know, I'm just really grateful that they're really willing to take a scary step. And as you said last week, not 100% of the teachers are engaged in doing what we want them to do, but to go with that 30% that's ready and let, and let them. Right. Um, that's, they're taking a big risk, um, not just at the teacher level, but at the upper administrative level. Well, I'm just that's struggling. true. They're willing to put on high heels and jump across. Well, that's right. What's that chasm? Repelling, Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I, I agree with Cheryl, just excited about uh, giving the teachers a, a shower yeah. fire that, that we need to give them and allowing them just to be, uh, you know, focused on the, on the learners and just, uh, you know, let, let the kids just learn. I love that. I'm going to say something about it in just a second. You. Okay. Communication is key. Communication your, is key. With your relationships between parents, teachers, kids, your partnerships, I mean, everything. If you don't have that, none of this is going to work. And not only communication, but really listening. When you go and tell somebody, hey, what do you need? Tell me what you need. And they do, and then it's just out there. You know, and it's never, there's no feedback. They never come back and give you what you need or tell you where you could find it. So I just think communication is key. The second thing I want to say is I've been in this district a long time. And I want to tell you that for the most part, the teachers that are here, they're here to teach because they love kids. Sure. They are not here for a paycheck. And they really want to do the right thing. Love that. And, uh, they just do. I love that. Who's next? Tools and training for parents, because I think once this starts, they might freak out a little bit. Are Tools. Are just playing all day long? Or how can we extend what's happening in the school day with those questions that we talked about before um, for our parents, um, training for parents? Love it. Keep going. I was kind of curious as to what the learning spaces look like for this to happen. Do we keep building schools the way we've always built them, or are they, is this something different? It's a great question and a great observation, and it's different. It's different. I would add that I'm warming up to this. I love that. 
<laughs> I had when you said a couple weeks ago that there wasn't going to be a big rollout of a plan that concerns me a little bit, but it's sort of it's letting go. It's letting go of a lot of certainly the way we've done things in the past, but an organic process could really do something that I've not been open to before. And so that is scary, but exciting. Like yep. That's right. Keep going. We'll be here all night. Who hadn't gone? I'll say kind of what, along the lines of what Karen has said, one, I want to see this happen for my kids um, and for every <coughs> other child that's out there that doesn't have parents that are rooting for them. Um, and I think this mm. is an opportunity for that to happen. And I think instead of just being thankful and encouraging to our teachers as parents, forming groups where we can show support and be more forthright and challenging them with what are you doing for my kids and these other kids as well, um, and just pushing pushing everything forward. Yep. Telling our story. I, I it's all about the story. Everybody to tell our story. And, and um, I, I'm excited about um, giving teachers, kids, the opportunity to tell their story because oftentimes uh, they're uncomfortable doing that but if it becomes a culture where we are um, you know uh, telling the community here are the great things going on in our schools uh, it will be contagious mm -hmm. I'll go. I had a very good quote yesterday so I can't take credit for it but it applies to what's been done over the last few weeks as well as moving forward and that is it. I don't remember who, who the quote came from um, but it said that the, the electric light bulb was not a product of the continuous improvement process for candlesticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, I need that quote. That's a good one, yeah. I love that. It's kind of like faster the horses. Faster, faster horses, yeah. yeah. I thought about that. Keep going, keep I going. the idea of letting all kids go get their intelligence. Yep. Not just certain ones. Love that. Keep going. I have to hold you accountable. You haven't gone yet. <clears throat> I'll go, I'll, go I'll, Angelo. I'll, I'll honestly say that I'm, I'm really fired up and ready to go, like truthfully, because I believe in education, and I believe Abilene is a good place to raise your kids, and I'm, I'm ready to be utilized as a, as a tool in this whole process. So you can count on me to, to um, with my own students that I work with, uh, to share this information, apply the principles, as well as encourage our teachers and in, in any way form. I don't mind coming out of pocket, so. Um, if we ever want to start a movement to get behind our teachers and our leaders, call me in. I'm in a Love it. Insane work ethic, man. Yes, I like sir. it. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and go on. I'm excited about the moving away from the standards part of it. Um, it's kind of about the moving away from the standards part of it. Um, especially with my job, I'm not really standards based, even though we do a lot to support the STAR and testing, but to actually getting down to what kids need getting down to life skills and meet to help them be successful in their lives. So maybe shifting our focus back to what we really want to do as counselors, but still doing our star job, <laughs> but making sure that we are serving the needs of our kids to help them reach what they need to reach. And not yep. so much worry about plans and credits and things like that. Oh, God. I, I just hope for the best. Like, I would love to see all these changes being made before I'm done in high school. And, like, let us not, like, just be a thing that we came to do here and put everything on paper. Let us put up everything at practice. You know? yep. like, put it into practice. Yep. Has everybody gone? David? Okay, so. David, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've acknowledged. And several people have brought this up. I mean, this is a cruise liner, not a speedboat, right? right? It didn't get the way it is overnight. It's not going to change overnight. However, we have got to be mindful of it can be better tomorrow than it was today. And we've got to find those, you know, how do you eat elephant in the room? One bite at a time, right? And so what are the first steps that we take? And so that's what we've got to be, be mindful of is that this is a, it's just going to evolve. And, yep. and that's, but we've got to start. Yep. We, we can't be uh, fire ready, aim, but we can't be ready, aim, 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 aim. aim. right. I was going to use that example. That's perfect. That was on my mind. 
You, you can't be ready, aim, 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 aim. Right, you gotta fire sometime. So now's the time. Here's mine, and I get graphics, sorry. Didn't give you that option. <laughs> hey, this is me on my way to Abilene today. I stopped in Temple because I had some stuff to drop off to my uh, son and daughter-in-law, and that's me and my grandson, Hayes. I want Hayes to go to a school like we're talking about. He's six months old, right? When he gets to be in school, I want him to hit the ground running in a school that's already established, that's got a maker space and a genius hour, and I want somebody to find the very best in him. And I don't you know to what he's going to Hey, hey. <laughs> and you know what? They may be in Abilene. Who knows? So they're in Temple now. They're working their way over. So next stop may be Abilene. So that's what I want for him, right? That's what I want for my grandson is a place that really is meaningful and relevant for him. And, and yeah, I want him to learn how to read and write and do math, obviously. I want him to be a good person. I want him to be prepared for life. So you guys are awesome. This is the first push of the ball. So we just got to keep pushing. Got to keep pushing. Thank you. You're amazing. Really appreciate you guys doing this and your commitment to the work. And I'm giving you a few minutes back tonight. So thank you for your time. David. Thank Dr. Colson for helping us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.